Good afternoon and welcome to Capital Account. I'm Lauren Lister and I want to get straight to our show today because we have another day, another record low for the U.S. Treasury. The 10-year, the 2-year, but could this be the biggest bubble we have ever seen? Well, here to talk about this is someone who has said he thinks as much, famed investor Dr. Mark Faber, publisher of the Gloom, Boom and Doom Report and author of many books, including the one you see here, Tomorrow's Gold, Asia's Age of Discovery. And he joins us from Agora Financial symposium in Vancouver and Dr. Faber let me first say that it is a real pleasure to have you on the show today welcome back to capital account well the pleasure is entirely mine oh it really is all mine because I'm dying to hear what you have to say about treasuries because you've said before in explaining why people are willing to buy US treasuries that offer a negative real yield or even invest in instruments with a negative nominal yield that people think if I give my money to the US government for example at least I know how much I'm losing if I give it to a fund manager I may use lose 30 <laughs> percent I'd rather lose two to three how long do you think this trend can or will continue where investors are willing to lose money just in order to know that they'll at least get some of it back well I think that's a very good question because as you know uh, Treasury yields peaked out in 1981 with the 10 years at 15.84 percent and now we're below 1.5 percent and some of my friends who are the super bears on asset prices and on uh, inflation they think that they will ha we will have deflation they think that yields could drop to say less than one percent on the 10 years and less than two percent on the 30 years so it, it may happen but say it's like if you said at the end of 99 the nasdaq is a bubble well, it still went up between December 99 and March 2000 by 30 percent. And afterwards, people lost a hell of a lot of money on, in Nasdaq stocks. So all I'm saying is I don't think that from a longer term perspective to own U.S. Treasuries is a desirable investment. But if you ask me, can they rally somewhat more? Yes, possible. I just wouldn't buy them at this level. I think the risk outweighs the return potential mm -hmm. and let's talk about that risk because you've been very outspoken that you think u.s treasuries are in a bubble perhaps the biggest bubble ever i know you've said and you just said it now that you can't say when it will pop but if you're right what happens at that point when we do see a lot of fireworks in the treasury market as people come to realize that they own the wrong investments and they start to come out of them fast what's the damage then Well, for the last few years, we had very big inflows into bond funds and outflows from the equity markets, from the equity funds. And I think both in Japan and in the U.S., if interest rates started to rise, there would be a reallocation of funds probably out of treasuries, out of JGBs in Japan, into the equity markets. And so I'm not so concerned in terms of equity markets going down when yields will go up again. I'm more concerned about the U.S. government mm -hmm. that if yields would rise significantly, the interest payments on the government debt would go up significantly. And what would then happen is that the deficits, instead of coming down, would continue to escalate and the credit quality of the U.S. would then decline. That's interesting. So worse for the U.S. government than for investors. Let's speak about uh, who is also a large customer yes. for, for the U.S. government's debt and also has been driving global growth. I want to talk about China because I know we, I've heard you talk about China. I want to differentiate here between your short and long term view because you've said before long term. It's easy to say China will continue to grow. But like America in the 1800s, there will be bumps along the road. America had recessions. America had financial crises wars a depression so what's your short-term outlook for China because there are a number of prominent China bears out there maybe there's some of your bear friends you mentioned like Jim Chanos and Hugh Hendry who point to the effects <laughs> of what may be the greatest credit and investment boom the world has seen well let me point out uh, 
a difference between China and the U.S. The U.S. had a credit bubble built on consumption. In other words, the debt level on the household sector level, government level, went up dramatically to finance consumption. In the case of China, at least it financed investments in infrastructure, in research and development, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And that is a key difference. Now, if you have a capital spending bubble, like in China, the downturn can be very severe because you run into overcapacities and then if you print money, you produce even more overcapacities. And the fact is simply that if you look at uh, reliable statistics, say, which country is the largest export market for Taiwan and South Korea? It's mm -hmm. China. Mm -hmm. And if you look at exports from Korea and Taiwan, they're all flat year on year. Mm -hmm. So that is quite reliable. You look at electricity production in China, it's up 1% year on year, mm -hmm. and so forth and so on. So the statistics would actually suggest that the Chinese economy is much weaker than what the official statistics suggest. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that the whole Chinese uh, growth model will collapse entirely. But I'd like to mention one thing. In mm -hmm. China, we still have a one-party system, mm -hmm. and we have an incredible level of corruption. Mm. And that could lead to social unrest at mm -hmm. some point. Mm -hmm. By the way, we can have social unrest anywhere in the world, right. given the high unemployment that we are facing in most countries. Mm -hmm. But that could derail growth in China for a while. I, I, and Dr. then we Faber, have geopolitical problems coming right. up, the South China Sea, and so forth and so on. Okay. So there are many things that could go wrong. I, I want to get in here before we go, because you're talking about a few statistics uh, indicating a slowdown. I want to see how it fits into your view of a global recession, because I know for China, for example, there was a positive manufacturing report out today suggesting government policy to support the economy is working. But I actually want to look at another indicator, at something uh, tied very closely to the health of the Chinese economy, which is steel. And recently, Chinese steel prices have fallen. The world's most traded steel futures in Shanghai, the rebar future, hit its 2012 low. And our viewers are looking at a chart of spot market prices for rebar in three of China's largest cities that are at their lowest levels in at least a year. So I'm curious if this is something you have your eyes on, not just in terms of a slowdown in China, but also in terms of the global recession I know you're predicting for 2013, and if it's gaining momentum. <laughs> Yes, I think you can be sure that we have uh, recessionary conditions already now in Europe, no growth. The U.S. economy has been slowing down, and if the Chinese economy slows down meaningfully, it has a huge impact on other emerging economies, and the emerging economic bloc today is like 60% of world's GDP, and that's where the growth is coming from. So if the Chinese economy slows down, it has actually a much larger impact on the global economy than the U.S. economy slowing down. Because the U.S. economy is largely service-oriented economy. We have 70% of GDP is consumption, and of the 70% uh, consumption, 70% are services. Mm -hmm. They don't require commodities mm -hmm. and uh, significant imports. So a slowdown in China mm -hmm. will have a very, very dire impact on the global economy. I guess what I'm asking is, are we already there? Are we already at that tipping point? <laughs> yeah, I think if I look with my own eyes at the world, and I travel extensively, in Asia, we're not yet in recession, but there's no growth because we had boom times from the recovery in 2009 to 2011, and now we're gone ex gross. I can see it everywhere. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't mean that everything will crash, mm -hmm. but I think there is a possibility that we'll get some kind of a crash. All right, and Dr. Also, Faber, it doesn't mean I'm that so stocks sorry. Will go down We're out of time. I'm going to have to leave you right there with a prediction for a crash, but a good one to end on. Dr. Faber, editor of the Gloom, Boom, and Doom Report, founder of Mark Faber Limited.
And still ahead, the LIBOR saga continues as more reports come out about the criminal investigations underway into a possible trader manipulation ring. What alternatives do we actually have to the way LIBOR is set? We'll talk to Zero Hedge contributing editor Bob English after the break, but first, your closing market numbers. We just put a picture of me when I was like nine years old on to tell the truth. Confession, I am a total ghetto princess. I love rap and hip hop music and Christian music. I thought he was kind of a dick yesterday. I'm very proud of the role that Al Jazeera has played. You know how sometimes you see a story and it seems so whole and complete, you think you understand it, and then you glimpse something else. You hear or see some other part of it and realize everything you thought you knew, you don't know? I'm Tom Hartman. Welcome to The Big Picture. drives the world. The fear mongering used by politicians. Who makes decisions? Considerable breakthrough has already been made. Who can you trust? No one who is imbued with a global missionary zeal. Where are we heading? State controlled capitalism is called fascism. When nobody dares to ask, we do. RT question more. Welcome back. Let's switch gears a bit because more reports have come out about the civil and criminal probe into LIBOR. The Wall Street Journal reports several groups of traders are under investigation by regulators around the world for allegedly working together to rig interest rates. It was an interest rate rigging ring is what it sounds like, allegedly. More than a dozen traders from at least nine banks are under scrutiny. And we keep hearing more and more about this investigation. But what about LIBOR itself? What is being discussed in the way of alternatives to a benchmark interest rate that is the underpinning of an estimated $550 trillion in financial products, but which we've seen seems like it can be pretty easily rigged? Well, alternatives are actually something that Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke, wouldn't you know, spoke about before Congress in a hearing last week. Let's listen. Federal Reserve has not uh, you know, come out in favor of a specific one, but a number of possibilities include uh, uh, repo rates, um, the so-called OIS uh, index, um, uh, and even uh, potentially Treasury bill rates, for example. And so those are his ideas. Now, central bankers from around the world will reportedly join Bank of England Governor Mervyn King in September to meet about the future of LIBOR. So, what would happen if a $100 trillion indicator was simply switched by the central banking cabal overnight? What happens to old LIBOR and LIBOR-based contracts? What room is created for major power plays? We should probably try to figure all that out. And here to help us do that is Bob English, contributing editor for Zero Hedge and economicpolicyjournal.com. And he has really been looking into all of this and has some really, really interesting insights. So first of all, Bob English, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks. It's great to be back here again. And yes, we are going to be discussing LIBOR. <laughs> <laughs> all right. That's not going away anytime soon. First, Bob, I want to ask you about no. Bernanke broadly. He talked about switching to a market-based indicator, possibly. But please decode for us, because this is Ben, ben Bernanke. Is Bernanke's mm. definition of a market-based indicator the same as your definition of a market-based indicator, or probably mine or a lot of our viewers? 
I, I would think not, and we need to take a step back here for a second to just think about what, who is a great manipulator when it comes to LIBOR, and that's none other than the central bankers themselves, because it is them, after all, who are setting these short-term interest rates, um, and it's their mandate to manipulate them. And all these other derivatives from them, whether it's LIBOR or the OIS or repo rates, are really just that. They're derivatives off of this great manipulation scheme that we already have going. So once we get beyond that, we have uh, Bernanke coming up and saying that yes we have a couple uh, or actually three market-based uh, alternatives and uh, we can discuss those for you right now yeah let's get into those but but before I do what I'm hearing you say is that these alternatives that Bernanke is proposing are actually more manipulated than having private bankers manipulating LIBOR potentially I think so because if you look at them uh, for instance he mentions uh, Treasury securities well the the LIBOR market itself is unsecured meaning that these banks that lend to each other overnight um, at various rates or on various other terms they're lending without collateral and Treasury securities are backed by the full faith and credit of the United States so anything like LIBOR is going to command a premium and if you're gonna have uh, a LIBOR substitute that's based on Treasury interest rates or T-bill rates, you're going to have to have a formula that calculates that premium. So if we think this through, who gets to calculate that premium? And what, you know, what council are they going to form to do this? Behind what closed doors are they going to have this meeting? Mm -hmm. um, so it's as always, who gets to make these big decisions? And I don't think people have focused on that. That's interesting. So who do you think would uh, determine that premium in the case of, say, using T-bills instead of, instead of LIBOR? Well, we go to this September 9th meeting that's going to occur. Um, it's going to precede another meeting uh, by a bunch of BIS bankers and the Financial Stability Council. So most people haven't heard of, of a lot of these organizations, but they're pretty much accountable to no one, um, at least in terms of the democratic sense that we think about it. Uh, so I think the Financial Stability Oversight Council, um, which is related to its U.S. counterpart, would play a big role in that. So essentially central bankers or some kind of central banker like authority yes okay yes. so there's a there's option number one let's go to option number two repo rates what what are repo rates for anybody that doesn't know and and what are the issues with it being used as a substitute for LIBOR Repo rates, a repurchase contract is basically like a loan, and it can be, it can also be on an overnight basis, um, and it is secured like a loan with some kind of collateral, and the collateral itself might, might be one of these T-bills we were just talking about, it might be corporate uh, paper. Uh, most likely, if Bernanke is talking about um, setting interest rates that are a substitute for LIBOR off of this, it's going to be probably a general collateral treasury repo rate. And so this gets back to the problem that we have with treasury. You have to figure out a premium um, that's going to be charged because this is a secured loan. And who gets to calculate the premium? So uh, we're back at that argument. Back at who gets to calculate the premium. And would it be the same answer in this case, some kind of central banking authority? I exactly. And again, it's only a guess, but it's, uh, it's a likely one at that. Okay. So likely guess number two for central banking determined uh, premium. Let's go to the third option, which is overnight index swaps. Again, Bob, what are these and, and what are the issues if it was used instead of LIBOR? Okay, the overnight index swap, or OIS, is basically tied to an average of the federal funds rate. And the federal funds rate is better known to a lot of people that follow uh, the, the machinations of the Federal Reserve as the interest rate that the Federal Reserve manipulates, <coughs> excuse me, targets um, to try and set short-term interest rates. And so when the FOMC comes out with its policy decision and, and on CNBC or capital account, they say the Fed cut the, the uh, Fed funds target rate by 0 0.25 or 25 basis points. That's what they're talking about. So the problem with the federal funds market, um, and at least it's unsecured, so we have more of an apples to apples comparison, is that since October of 2008, it's a vastly different market. And that's a time period uh, in which banks uh, got the ability to receive uh, payments called interest on excess reserves by the mm -hmm. Federal Reserves. So they park all their excess money at the Fed and get an interest rate, which uh, heretofore had never been done before. Um, so the federal funds market doesn't behave like the other markets anymore. And I can tell you a few reasons why. Let's hear them. 
Okay. Um, the first is the biggest sellers in the market are the GSEs. That's Fannie and Freddie. Now, why are these guys the biggest lenders or sellers? That's because they don't have the ability, as depository in institutions do, to get that 0.25 interest rate. So they have to lend their funds out to banks so that the banks can collect that interest rate. Um, so you have these two dominant players, Fannie and Freddie, as the biggest sellers. And by a Federal Reserve uh, economists, the senior ones, own admission in an email to a reader of Economic Policy Journal. He admits that these, uh, that Fannie and Freddie prefer to do business only with a handful of banks. So we have the two GSEs uh, operating with a handful of banks and setting it an interest rate policy um, that has billions, if not trillions, tied to it. And where have we heard this before? I mean, isn't this the very problem that we're trying to overcome? Right. And I want to bring up that email. Because because we do have a quote from it, just so our audience can see from this senior Fed Thank official you. or economist that you said uh, sent this to uh, an economic policy journal uh, uh, employee. Anecdotal evidence suggests that all of the housing related entities are willing to lend to the same few banks, which limits the possibility for competition to raise market rates. So, so that's what you're talking about right there. I also want to look at the spread between federal funds and LIBOR and what that's done over the years, Bob. Let's bring that up for our viewers to see sure. because it pretty much is it's closely matched for m many of these years. It, it gets really out of line during late 2000, 2000 and, or 2007 and to 2009. But before we talk about what was going on there, why is, is there any reason why it's so closely matched for the majority of those years? Well, it was we were in a period of relative stability, and um, you could have all these um, algorithms or even human traders that would tightly arb out any differences between it and the uh, federal funds rate. Um, what happens is when you get to a period of market instability, then you have these large pockets of money that are no longer willing to commit their resources to arbing these things out because timing can uh, make you have a multi-billion dollar mistake in a, in a matter of seconds. So the spreads widen, which is exactly what we would have expected um, when the financial panic uh, came into view in early 2007 and accelerated in, in late 2007. So what we see there is really what we would expect. Okay, so so nothing to nothing to see here in terms of of the the connection between the federal funds rate and LIBOR. Well. Um, there, there are certainly plenty of room for the banks to have manipulated for their own benefit on a daily basis um, by submitting erroneous or outright false um, interest rates uh, to affect the mean. Mm -hmm. um, but I think overall, in the big picture, um, like I said at the beginning, the greatest manipulator of interest rates are the central banks, and in this case particularly uh, the Federal Reserve. Um, so getting back to LIBOR, yes, there's room for manipulations by the banks, and they were probably doing that, um, but we need to look at the bigger picture. And you're saying that the bigger picture is the manipulation of LIBOR, and your view by these private banks is, is not the huge scandal it's cracked out to be? I don't think it's this, the scandal of the century, and you kind of have to look at the timing of this. Uh, a good friend of mine, Dave Harrison, who writes at TradeWithDave.com, points out, uh, pointed out to me and in his blog, that there is a lawsuit that's been going on for years against Hank Greenberg and AIG um, regarding the financial panic, and they're and they're uh, they're implicated as having con conducted uh, insurance um, shenanigans and, and financial statement shenanigans, and there. Are some emails by Elliot Spitzer, the New York Attorney General at the time, who had prosecuted the case, um, supposedly done by a private email address that are coming to light, and a judge is about to rule. And these emails could exculpate uh, Hank Greenberg and AIG, and this whole LIBOR thing could, at least in part, be kind of a pushback um, because there's kind of a there's a, a shift occurring, um, if I'm reading this correctly, on Wall Street, where we have a separation of of the big banks from the administration. They're not as tight as they used to be. And you have Warren Buffett coming out kind of bearish on treasuries and talking down about uh, the muni bonds. So things are a little bit different right now. That's interesting. So you think that this LIBOR scandal could be a bargaining chip for Washington to use in, in balancing out something like this AIG lawsuit that, that makes Wall Street look bad? 
Never let a good crisis go to waste. Never let a good crisis go to waste. Then I want to ask your opinion on this that Timothy Geithner said when he talked about the regulatory response to LIBOR. Let's take a listen and then I, I have a question for you. The CFTC justice FSA action in this context, very powerful enforcement action, very important to right. do, very consequential deterrence to this behavior, and it's the first step. There's more to come. Okay, so he's talking a talk, and you just gave a reason, reason why you think Washington might want to try to get back at Wall Street. But sorry, I have to be skeptical, Bob. How do we know that this isn't Timothy Geithner doing his PR thing? Because we already know he's under scrutiny for not doing enough back in 2008 when he reportedly learned that LIBOR was being manipulated by Barclays. I, I don't doubt that this has to do, at least in part, with his own PR spin. Um, but when you look at the big picture, um, you, you have to see where this is all going. And LIBOR is a $100 trillion market, and the central planners have their ability to get their, their fingers in all of this and kind of determine the direction um, and get to tell a bunch of institutions whether or not they're going to survive or not. And those are the power play manipulations that they really thrive on. So. Um, they have a big stake in this too. So briefly before we go, do you really think that LIBOR could be this turning point where Washington goes after the banks and, and will it constitute that turning point if we only see mid and low level traders get arrested or have charges brought towards them and not senior level executives? I don't doubt that history will view this as a turning point. Um, is it the actual catalyst? There are probably other factors involved. But in terms of the public face of, um, of the evil bankers and banksters and everything, um, this is kind of a defining moment because it, it's simple enough that the, uh, the broader public can understand and they're still kind of agitated about what happened in 2008. So you think that, it, but if senior level executives aren't charged, do you think that this is not going to be the turning point? Well, I, I think that they will be, and, and perhaps a few. And it's, if you think about it, it's kind of ridiculous that Corzine stole, John Corzine stole $1.6 billion from customers of MF Global out of the, uh, you know, the metaphorical safety deposit box. Um, and you have these guys who are, who are still walking the streets. Um, I don't think they're going to, at the end of the day, just go, uh, go after the uh, mid to lower level traders. I think a, a few big heads are going to roll. And that's the political punch that all of this packs. All right, you think maybe there's a political will for it with a scandal as big seeming as LIBOR that can go nicely on the cover of Time Magazine. Thank you so much, Bob English, contributing editor for Zero Hedge and Economic Policy Journal.com. And that is all we have time for. Thank you so much for watching and make sure to come back tomorrow. And in the meantime, you know you can follow me on Twitter at Lauren Lister and give us feedback at youtube.com slash capital account where you should also subscribe Watch us in HD on Hulu, and from everyone here, have a great night. Good afternoon and welcome to Capital Account. I'm Lauren Lister and I want to get straight to our show today because we have another day, another record low for the U.S. Treasury, the 10-year, the 2-year, but could this be the biggest bubble we have ever seen? Well, here to talk about this is someone who has said he thinks as much, famed investor Dr. Mark Faber, publisher of the Gloom, Boom and Doom Report and author of many books, including the one you see here, Tomorrow's Gold, Asia's Age of Discover, and he joins us from Agora Financial Symposium symposium in Vancouver. And Dr. Faber, let me first say that it is a real pleasure to have you on the show today. Welcome back to Capital Account. Well, the pleasure is entirely mine. Oh, it really is all mine because I'm dying to hear what you have to say about treasuries because you've said before in explaining why people are willing to buy U.S. treasuries that offer a negative real yield 
or even invest in instruments with a negative nominal yield that people think if I give my money to the U.S. government, for example, at least I know how much I'm losing. If I give it to a fund manager, I may use, lose 30 percent. <laughs> I'd rather lose two to three. How long do you think this trend can or will continue where investors are willing to lose money just in order to know that they'll at least get some of it back? Well, I think that's a very good question because, as you know, uh, Treasury yields peaked out in 1981 with the 10 years at 15.84 percent, and now we're below 1.5 percent. And some of my friends who are the super bears on asset prices and on uh, inflation, they think that they will ha we will have deflation. They think that yields could drop to, say, less than 1% on the 10 years and less than 2% on the 30 years. So it, it may happen, but say, it's like if you said at the end of 99, the NASDAQ is a bubble. Well, it still went up between December 99 and March 2000 by 30%. And afterwards, people lost a hell of a lot of money on, in NASDAQ stocks. So all I'm saying is, I don't think that from a longer term perspective to own U.S. Treasuries is a desirable investment. But if you ask me, can they rally somewhat more? Yes, possible. I just wouldn't buy them at this level. I think the risk outweighs the return potential. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about that risk, because you've been very outspoken that you think U.S. Treasuries are in a bubble, perhaps the biggest bubble ever. I know you've said, and you just said it now, that you can't say when it will pop. But if you're right, what happens at that point when we do see a lot of fireworks in the Treasury market as people come to realize that they own the wrong investments and they start to come out of them fast? What's the damage then? Well, for the last few years, we had very big inflows into bond funds and outflows from the equity markets, from the equity funds. And I think both in J 